All right, as we get ready to get into this message today, I'm going to call this message today, this is the series, Church, It's a Family, Not an Event. Today, how to be a problem solver. Anybody consider yourself a problem solver? You know, most guys, we all think, oh, I can fix it. I got it. I got to fix it, you know, and, or you may be a problem solver. But I read this story back when St. Petersburg, one of the most popular cities in Europe, was being established, being founded back in the 18th century. And city planners and builders were coming together, trying to lay out the road work and the inner structure of the city. There were large boulders that had been brought in, actually come in from glaciers from Finland that were obstructing a lot of the city's planning. And this one particular boulder was really large on, and it was right in the main thoroughfare that they were planning. So they solicited bids from different companies and, and people to try to remove this. And the bids were very, very expensive. Of course, they didn't have the heavy equipment that we have. They didn't have the explosives that we have today. Uh, and so they were, they were kind of at a stalemate, but some peasants, farmers uh, came up and said, hey, we'll move that boulder for you. And they offered a really, really low bid. Well, the city planners thought we don't really have anything to lose. So they gave them the job. Well, the farmer showed up the next day with a whole bunch of farmers and shovels. And they started digging a hole next to the big boulder, propped the boulder up with some timbers. And once they had dug the hole big enough, they removed the timbers, the rock, the boulder fell into the ground. They covered it up and then took the rest of the dirt away and carried it away. Now, what the other bidders had not considered, they had only thought of moving the boulder from one place to another on the surface of the city. What the farmers thought about was a different way of thinking. They thought up and down rather than just sideways. And since they couldn't go up, they decided to go down. Here's the thing I want you to realize. Anybody can identify a problem, but not everybody can identify a solution. And here's why this is important to us, because we're going to deal with problems in our life. There will be problems in your marriage. There'll be problems as a parent. There'll be problems at work. There'll be problems with our physical bodies. You're going to have problems with friends. You're going to have problems with family. You're going to have problems with uh, you know, emotional problems, psychological problems, problems at work. And I, this doesn't even mention the in-laws. I'm not even going there yet. But the, the ability to deal with your problems and to fix them, or at least learn how to gracefully... Uh, live with them is a skill that everybody needs. And so as we get into this next section in Acts, we're going to see that the church faces a problem. And if you don't realize it, churches, families have problems, and they're going to learn how to deal with this problem. And if we pay attention to what happens here in Acts chapter six, then we're going to be able to live with a higher degree of joy And stop dealing with the same problems over and over again. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse number 1. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom and we'll turn this responsibility over them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Let me stop right there. I want to talk about how to be a problem solver. Number one that we see right here is that you must have proper priorities. So here's a problem that we have. We got the Hebraic Jews who the Hebraic Jews, they're complaining because the Hellenistic Jews, uh, they feel like they're being overlooked in the daily distribution view. Now, the Hebraic Jews were believers who had rejected the Greek culture, and they spoke Hebrew or Aramaic, and they studied the Word of God according to their customs. The Hellenistic Jews were Jews that had been scattered during exile outside of Israel, but had come back. But after coming back, or before coming back, they had adopted the Greek customs and the the Roman customs uh, that they were subjected to. And so 
they came back in and they were living together with the Hebraic Jews, but there was a little bit of tension because the Hebraic Jews felt like they were kind of a cut above the Hellenistic Jews because they looked at the Hellenistic Jews as kind of worldly because they had taken on the Greek customs. It would be a whole lot like uh, if a family moves to America from another country, first generation kind of holds on to their customs from, let's say, Peter. So I see Peter Wesley right here. You come over, you will hold on to customs from India, uh, but Evan, your son, would probably be more likely to take on American customs uh, more easily than you would. And so there's this tension between living the different customs out, and that's the problem with the Hebraic and the Hellenistic Jews. Uh, so what they, they, they complain about is that they're being overlooked in this daily distribution, of, uh, daily distribution of food. So obviously there was a feeding program uh, for the Jews at this time. Now they come to the apostles with this problem and saying, look, there's a problem. But the apostles show us the importance of having proper priorities. What the apostles decided not to do was to get in the weeds in this problem, and they decided to fix it by saying, okay, listen, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect our ministry in prayer and the preaching of the word to distribute food. Now, they're, they're not saying that it's not important. They're just saying we have to have priorities in our life. And so it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of preaching and the study of the word and prayer to wait on tables. So I want you all to select seven men, submit seven names uh, who have these three qualifications, men who have a good reputation, men who are full of the spirit and men who are full of wisdom. So they ask for seven names and they realized it wouldn't be right for them to try to do both. So that's the important principle that we see here. But sometimes our problems are made worse because of our lack of proper priorities in marriages, it's real clear that most of the time opposites attract and we marry somebody who's very opposite of us. Starla and I are very different. I like sunrises. She likes sunset. I like coffee. She likes tea. I like sun. She likes shade. I like mountains. She likes beach. Uh, in, in every marriage and ours is no like there's a saver and there's a spender, right? There's a saver and there's a spender. And it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's just one values something over the other. The saver values security while the spender values experience. And so what, 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 there's not a right and there's not a wrong because you can find scriptural basis to back both of those mentalities. But what, what happens in marriages is you don't determine what is the proper priority for your marriage, at least in this season. And so if you don't discuss it and you don't determine it, then it becomes a problem. So there's, there's many issues that are solved whenever we have our priorities straight. It's true in marriage, true in health, true in fitness, true in money. It's true in parenting. Kids don't do what they're told. They do what they see modeled. You want kids that serve the Lord? You want kids that put God first? Then you've got to put God first. Can somebody say amen? All right, look at verse number five. This proposal, it pleased the whole group, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, uh, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands, their hands on them. So the word of God spread. Again, we're seeing continual growth in the New Testament church. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. All right, here's the second key that we see on how to solve problems. Number two, don't be afraid to ask for help. The apostles decided they're they not going to do this by themselves. They established their priorities, so they needed help, so they asked for help. And the same is true right here at Freedom Church. It takes a lot of people to make church happen around here. That's why we need people at the front doors greeting. We need people working the media booth. We need people serving in the coffee shop. We need people serving in the nursery and people serving in children's ministry and youth ministry and outreach ministry. And everybody has something to offer the family. 
We're all a part of this family. We all have a way to serve. That's why we're always recruiting because there's always a need to fill. Now, the apostles are no different. They asked the believers, set forth seven names. That's exactly what they did. We don't know much about five of them, but we know about two of them. We know about Stephen and we know about Philip because in the upcoming chapters, we're going to hear more about them. But don't be afraid to ask for help. That's a way to help solve problems. You may have heard about the two guys that went to have a steak dinner and they sat down for the meal at the restaurant and the waiter came out. They both ordered two filet mignons and they came out with those two steaks and they were on a platter and he set it down on the table. The problem was one was a small steak and one was a large steak and one of the guys picked up the platter and decided to serve his friend. And so he took the smaller steak and gave it to his friend and he took the larger steak for himself. And his friends kind of, you, you could tell he was frustrated by this. He said, look what you've just done. What are you talking about? How rude of you. He says, what are you talking about? He says, you took the big steak and gave me the small steak. And so well, how would you have handled it if you were serving the steaks? He said, well, if I were doing it, I would have given you the big steak and I would have taken the small steak. Well, I've got the big steak, so we're good, right? <laughs> That's one way to solve a problem. That's how Derek would have solved the problem. But it's probably not the most hospitable way to solve a problem, and it's probably not the most godly way to solve a problem. But if you want to solve problems, you got to be able to have people in your life that you can listen to, people who love God, people that love you. You don't have to have all the answers, but you need to have people in your life that can help you, that can speak into your life and give you direction when you most need it. Now, that brings me to a very important point. We have an upcoming presidential election. We see here in the scriptures that when the church needed help, they went through a process to elect some people to identify people that would help serve this church and meet the need of the church, right? We're facing an election that is a very critical election. It involves every single one of us being a part. And I want to challenge you as your pastor. I want to challenge you to be a part of this election because this is what I feel like. I feel like we have a lot of policies and we've seen a lot of moral decline in our country. It's your, your head's in the sand if you haven't seen it. And I recognize that our justice system is not fair. I recognize that our respect for law enforcement is not appropriate. I, res I, I, I recognize that our schools have become more uh, political indoctrination or ideology indoctrination camps. I, 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 it frustrates me, our willingness to accept DEI and CRT policies. Uh, that's just astonishing me, knowing where we've come from as a nation. Now, listen to me. You could vote for a candidate based on race. You could do that. You've got a white man and you've got a biracial woman. You could, you could vote based on just gender. You've got a man and a woman. You could vote based on history, making history. You could vote on just a party. I'm just, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. You could do that. But let me remind you what our country was built upon. It was built upon trust in God. Look at your dollar bills. It still says in God, we trust. It was built on smaller government. And it was built on an entrepreneurial spirit. Do you know what's destroying our country today? No God, bigger government, and dependence upon government. And here's what I mean by that. No God, no biblical guidelines, no moral absolutes. Whatever the majority thinks is okay is okay. And that's not okay. Bigger government, more programs that just cost the taxpayers more money. And then a dependence upon government, meaning expanded welfare programs that initially began with a right and a pure motive, but have just become a way that disincentivize personal responsibility and the entrepreneurial spirit. And while issues like health care matter, immigration matters, justice system matters, as a Christian, I believe there are some issues that are more important than others. 
religious freedom matters to me because the role of the church is to be a guiding light in this community. And we cannot allow our freedoms and our liberties and our light to be diminished because of the evil in this world. So being a part of the system, allowing our freedoms to be sustained and protected matter. Sanctity of life matters to me. And it should matter to the Christians because the protecting of the lives of the unborn matter. God will judge this nation on how we handle the most vulnerable in our society. And there's none more vulnerable than the unborn child. So the issues of religious freedom, sanctity of life, and traditional family values. And here's what I mean by that. The promotion of the LGBTQ plus agendas undermine traditional family values. Now, I love everybody, and we should all, I don't think that's even a question here at Freedom Church, but I have concern over the redefinition of family and marriage, which contradicts the natural order established by God. It goes exactly opposite of God's order of creation. And to try to redefine what marriage or family is simply because it's more consistent with the norms and standards of our culture today is an unbiblical agenda. And I've got concerns over the controversial issues of gender transitions among minors, allowing young people to make life-altering decisions regarding their gender is a catastrophic mistake that has irreversible consequences physically and psychologically. God is the one who is established. And here's why this is a biblical issue, because God is the one who has established our identity. And for us to decide or anyone to decide, God, you're wrong. I think I'm more comfortable as another gender is a slap in God's face. So while we have two imperfect candidates, there are policies that promote and encourage laws that would make it easier for teens to mutilate their bodies without parental consent and expand laws to protect the murder of unborn children. And so my challenge to you is to register to vote, get out and vote. I would challenge you to put aside affiliations. I would challenge you to put aside uh, your preferences and put aside your emotions and vote for what promotes biblical guidelines and biblical. Find the policies that align with a biblical alignment, not personality, not popularity. And I don't think the choice could be clear, but I challenge you to do your part. Just as the apostles saw the need for the church to come together and to be a part of helping find leadership that can help meet a need, this is our role as Christians in America to come up and do our part to help provide leadership that can help our country. Verse number eight. Now, Stephen... A man full of God's grace and power performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. But notice what they did. They secretly persuaded some men to say, we've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they're lying about him. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. And they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Here's the third thing I want to point out. We're talking about how to be a problem solver. You got to have your priorities straight. You've got to make sure that uh, you're not afraid to ask for help when you need help. Number three, we should always display compassion. Always display compassion. It says that Stephen's face was like the face of an angel. Notice Stephen wasn't angry even though they were lying about him. 
Stephen wasn't frustrated, even though they were accusing him of things he didn't do. Stephen wasn't angry. He wasn't frustrated. He wasn't fearful. He saw this as an opportunity to share his faith instead, because this is what I realized. Sometimes our problems are caused by emotions that get out of control. We get over emotional because somebody's lying about us. We get over emotional because somebody's misrepresented us. We get over emotional because things just aren't perfectly. I mean, usually our emotional decisions are the ones that we regret the most. I hear people say all the time, oh, I'm not feeling it. You know, your feelings shouldn't be the indicator of what causes you to determine to what, what to do and what not to do. It shouldn't be a determiner about your decisions and your choices because our emotions are inconsistent. Our emotions are up and our emotions are down. Now, they can be part of the equation, but you can't just decide on emotions alone. You ever called somebody and asked them what they were doing? They said, well, I'm eating cauliflower and kale. Oh, emotional eating. No, you, no, no, that's not emotional eating. But if they said, I'm eating ice cream and a milkshake, you would think emotional eating. Why? Because emotional eating is never healthy for you. And when we start allowing our emotions to drive us and our emotions to dictate our decisions, it's never healthy for us. That's why Romans 12 tells us, don't repay evil for evil but be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Our job is not to allow our emotions to overtake us, but to bring those emotions into alignment with God's will and God's plan in order to make better decisions. I was driving one day and I cut a guy off and I didn't mean to. I didn't see him. I honestly didn't, but, but, but this is probably the only time this ever happened. Uh, but I, I, because when he pulled up next to me, now I've cut him off plenty of times, but I meant to the other times. This time I didn't mean to. And, and he pulls up next to me, man, he's ready to give it to me. He was saying things about me and my mama that I can't repeat in church. But when I rolled down my window and just said, I am so sorry, my fault, my bad. It left him speechless. He didn't know what to say. He was ready for confrontation. He was ready for a fight. He was ready to give it to me. And when I just said, I'm sorry, my bad. I didn't see you. He didn't know what to do. Listen, if you want to solve problems, you got to rise above emotions, be wise, be compassionate, and be forgiving. And when you do, you'll be free. You want to live in freedom? Don't let your emotions tell you what to do. You tell your emotions how you're going to feel. Bruce Goodrich was being initiated into the cadet corps at Texas A&M University. And one night he was in his hazing and initiation was forced to run until he finally dropped, but he never got back up. Bruce Goodrich died before he ever even went to his first class in college. Short time after this tragedy, Bruce's father wrote a letter to the administration, the faculty, and to the student body, and to the Corps of Cadets. Here's what he said. He said, I'd like to take this opportunity to express the appreciation of my family for the great outpouring of sympathy and concern from Texas A&M University and the college community over the loss of our son, Bruce. We were deeply touched by the tribute paid to him in the battalion. We were particularly pleased to note that his Christian witness did not go unnoticed during his brief time on campus. Mr. Goodrich went on. He said, I hope it will be of some comfort to know that we harbor no ill will in the matter. We know our God makes no mistakes. Bruce had an appointment with his Lord and he is now secure his heavenly home. When the question is asked, why did this happen? Perhaps one answer will be so that many will consider where they will spend eternity. Freedom, listen to me. Your response in difficult moments, in challenges, gives you an opportunity to be a witness for the Lord 
and being a witness for the Lord and causing people to question where they will spend eternity is way more important on whether you're right or whether you're wrong. You want to be a good problem solver? Make sure your priority is in proper alignment. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And I would challenge you today. You know, you want to help? You want to serve at Freedom? Take the connection card and mark on there. I want to serve. Drop it off at the New to Freedom area on the way out today. But more importantly, always respond and display compassion. People can find hotheads everywhere. People can find emotional responses and reactions everywhere. You know what's lacking? Compassion. A compassionate response to a volatile situation. And when you do that, you're going to have the same powerful impact as Stephen did. And they said his face was like a face of an angel. We may not have faces that look like an angel, but we can certainly respond in a way that would cause people to question why we responded that way, how we kept our cool, how we could say that or do that or be that way in that difficult circumstances. Always display compassion, and that will allow you to be the peacemaker in any room that you walk in. Stand to your feet with me. As you stand, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment. With your heads bowed, I don't know what kind of problems you may be facing today. I don't know what kind of mountain you're standing in front of. What kind of difficulty has you at a stalemate? But I think whatever we're facing today should cause all of us to consider where we'll spend eternity. I want to challenge you that if you've never made a decision to follow Christ, choose Jesus today. If you have wandered away from your faith, I challenge you, come back to Jesus today and say, Jesus, today I surrender all. He will hear you. He will respond. And beyond that, those who are here today say, I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able. If you're here today and you're facing a challenge, maybe God's looking at you to respond in the way Stephen did that would harbor no unforgiveness, that would harbor no anger, that would harbor no ill will towards those who are persecuting you, lying about you, doing you wrong. You would harbor no resentment and maybe your reaction would cause people to turn to Jesus. I'm praying that God will give you the ability to do that. As difficult as that may seem, I'm praying that God would give you an anointing today to have a compassionate response in your most difficult moment. I want to pray first of all for those who are here and say, you know what, I realize I need to say yes to Jesus. Or maybe you're online right now watching this. Say, I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. I want to pray this simple prayer. And I want those of you here today, either here in this room or those watching online, that would say, you know what, I know I'm not where I need to be, but I'm ready to get there. Would you say this with me and everyone pray so no one prays alone? Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. Come into my heart. Wash away my sin and be the Lord of my life today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.